Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, many of you may know, remember me from our last uh, event. My name is Peter Reisman, and I am co-chair of the CGCC Government and Public Relations Committee. I'm also the Managing Director and Chief Communications Officer at Bank of China USA. Uh, we wanna thank you for taking the time out of your day today to be here with us. Um, but before we begin, um, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping rules. Um, today's event will be recorded and uploaded to CGCC's YouTube channel. Um, today's comments, while they are on the record, the opinions expressed, including those of the moderator and the speakers, do not necessarily represent the institutions we all work for. Um, later on in the event, you will all have the opportunity to ask our distinguished speakers questions. If you have any questions throughout the course of the webinar, please feel free to type them in the Q&A box by clicking the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. And of course, our speakers will do their very best to address these questions um, during the Q&A session. Um, with that, let us now welcome CGCC Chairman, President and CEO of Bank of China USA, Mr. Xu Chen, to give us some welcoming remarks. Mr. Xu. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome to our CGCC members and friends. Today's event, Inciting to Congress, we are honored to co-host it with the association of former members of our Congress. This uh, association works with both former and current members of our Congress on a bipartisan basis and provides numerous, numerous uh, public programs, including those on energy policy, global trade, security, and transportation. As you all know, CGCC USA represents an important group of Chinese and US business leaders and corporate citizens. We will support communities and economic development across the United States. While there is no way to predict when this pandemic will end, there are some economic indications that a light at the end of the tunnel is becoming brighter. With more and more people being vaccinated, businesses are getting to reopen, international trade is recovering, and the markets are responding positively. CGCC continues to invest in programming and services to our members as our government engage in dialogue and seek common ground on the many challenges ahead. Over 40 years of bilateral trade and investment have brought enormous benefits to business and the consumers in the US, China, and across global markets. However, it has always been the people-to-people -people relations that has served as a cornerstone to bringing trust and resolving our business are governed by complicated laws and regulations that we all must follow, including those on trade and cross-border investment. We invest resources and millions of dollars in compliance and sometimes litigation surrounding these laws. Therefore, it is necessary for our members to gain a better understanding as to how these laws are being crafted and debated, how various committees on Capitol Hill work in balancing competing interests. And finally, how business can or should engage with the public officials to foster mutual understanding and trust. Thank you again for attending this important conversation. Peter. Thank you, Chairman Xu, for those uh, opening remarks, and of course, for all of your support and leadership throughout the CGCC organization. Um, I think your remarks um, are certainly very much on point um, when we talk about how companies have to deal with compliance and the amount of resources in um, abiding by all the laws and regulations that come out on, uh, very often on a, on a day to day basis. Um, understanding how the committees work um, and being able to understand better um, how to engage with these, uh, these public officials um, on the issues that are important to our companies. Um, so with that, it is, it is my pleasure to welcome our two distinguished speakers for today's event. Um, we will ask them to give a few brief opening remarks 
uh, and then we will move on to a moderated session. Um, we will start with the Honorable Mike Bishop. Uh, Mr. Bishop is a former Republican member of the U.S. Congress uh, from Michigan, serving served from 2014 to 2018. Uh, during his tenure in Congress, Mr. Bishop was appointed to serve on the House Committee on Ways and Means, the, Ju the Judiciary, and Higher Education. Um, let's start with, with Mr. Bishop. Well, thank you very much for including me, and um, I'm honored to be here. Uh, the chairman's words are, are uh, very poignant, and uh, I think um, uh, really frame this discussion very well. Um, our two countries, the United States and China, have been locked in a cycle of increasing competition and really confrontation over a lot of issues, uh, specifically trade, uh, technology, um, national security, uh, the pandemic, and all of this has been complicated by domestic politics. Um, and I think this discussion is intended to review uh, the political considerations, the leadership dynamics and uh, legal developments that will affect the US-China foreign policy going forward. We just went through um, four years of, I think, troubling um, times with uh, the Trump administration in terms of its impact on US-China relations. In looking at the bills that are being introduced into the current legislature and, um, and as in current Congress and, and the previous Congress, it's very clear that there is an increasing interest in the China-US relationship. And that's something to watch closely. Uh, because it does address all those issues that I was just uh, I just pointed out. Um, these are these are times where um, we're all waiting to see exactly how the new administration is going to transition uh, this relationship. Uh, I watched with great interest the first salvo of of, uh, of um, uh, open discussion we had with the Biden administration and uh, China uh, in their, their meeting in Anchorage. Uh, it was a little chilling at first, but I understand from what I'm hearing now that uh, uh, as soon as the cameras went off and the parties were able to go behind closed doors, uh, there was some progress made. So I think that's an optimistic step in the right direction. I'm glad to know that um, we're uh, hopefully on track to repair and to, to find a, a way forward uh, with the two countries. We have so much in common, so much uh, uh, that we need to work on together in a global economy uh, that I think is very important that we put our differences aside and find ways to work together. So I'm glad to be a part of this discussion and I appreciate your inclusion. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, the last uh, four years have been challenging um, but I suspect the next uh, four years we'll, we'll, we'll discuss uh, in a few minutes. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, the Honorable Al Wynn. Um, he is a former Democratic member of the U.S. Uh, House of Representatives, representing Maryland's 4th Congressional District. Um, while in the House, Mr. Wynn served on the House Energy and Commerce Committee and chairman of its subcommittee on Environment and Hazardous Materials, and as a member of the subcommittee on energy and air air quality. Um, Mr. Wynn, please. Congressman Wynn. I think Congressman Wynn, I think you might be on mute still. Yes, I think <laughs> that is true. That is something I'm often the victim of in this new uh, Zoom. Are, are we all? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was saying, although you couldn't hear me, that I really appreciate this opportunity to be with you uh, today uh, to talk about this very important issue. Delighted to be with my uh, colleague, uh, former Congressman uh, Bishop. Uh, to say that we are in a challenging environment may be an understatement. Um, while I agree that we have a lot in common and a lot that we can cooperate uh, on, I think the reality is that uh, we face serious headwinds from a commercial and trade standpoint. I refer to the 2021 annual threat assessment. Uh, intelligence community basically came back and said that China was the most significant 
long-term threat. And obviously that was quite concerning. Uh, I think there are three areas basic of, basically of concern. Uh, the economic area where there are concerns about blurred lines between business and government, subsidies, things like forced uh, tech transfer uh, and, and similar concerns. Um, I think that's one area. I think also the military uh, activism in the Indo-Pacific is of concern. And then third, the human rights concerns uh, that have certainly come to the forefront uh, under a democratic administration and with democratic majorities in the House and in the Senate. Uh, issues relating to Hong Kong and Xinjiang uh, are obviously of great concern. We just went through, it was referenced to a difficult and challenging Trump era with a tariff war, 250 billion against China. China in turn retaliates against the United States. So the question becomes, okay, well now what uh, in the, with the new administration and the new legislative majorities? Well, first of all, in terms of the Trump tariffs, I think in the short term, they're gonna remain. Uh, I think they're under review, multi-agency review, which is a slow process by the Biden administration, giving the administration time to kind of evaluate the situation and the relationships. Uh, the uh, recent uh, summit in Alaska was a, a good start because obviously the parties are talking to each other. So that's helpful, but we'll have to see what happens with the Trump tariffs down the road. Um, in terms of pros economic prospects, trade prospects, I would say a lot of it is really sector dependent. Uh, for companies in the telecom area, semiconductor area, sensitive technologies, AI, uh, data management, particularly uh, sensitive personal data management, there's going to be a great deal of scrutiny. Um, I think the Commerce Department has so many lists. They have the Commerce Control list, uh, the military end users list, the entities list, and then DOD has, has a further list uh, addressing companies of, of concern. And so I would put all that in the category of, of obstacles that businesses will confront. Obviously, the CFIUS uh, process, which is another interagency review process that looks at uh, foreign direct investment in the United States. All these entities and lists will basically involve a process of higher scrutiny given, as I say, this challenging landscape. Uh, last year, you had Senator Kennedy's bill uh, dealing with delisting uh, foreign companies uh, on the stock exchange if they were not, or did not allow uh, US regulators to conduct audits of public accounting reports. So that was significant. And I think most recently, you would have to look at the legislation coming out of the Senate, Endless Frontiers, and Strategic Competition Act, both of which aimed directly at, at China, uh, with the idea of number one, more competition from US companies, uh, supply chain uh, resiliency review, um, and lots of grants and additional money, which is a competition in. So you've got the obstacles, but you also have more competition as the United States is gonna invest significantly more money uh, in its business sector, its research. Uh, so that's kind of a, 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 a dim uh, or certainly again, challenging uh, perspective, but I think there are opportunities. I said uh, a lot of this climate would be sector dependent. If you're not in those sensitive, uh, if your business is not in those sensitive areas, uh, if you're involved in agriculture or construction, particularly if you're involved in the climate sector, uh, wholesale, retail, I think there are lots of opportunities. I've got a, a colleague, actually a Republican member, who says we're ready to sell soybeans <laughs> to anyone who's ready to buy. Uh, so if you're involved in that aspect of trade, uh, non-sensitive areas, I think there will be lots of opportunities. Let me wrap up by just saying, I think the key will be communication. I think this is basically what my colleague, uh, Congressman Bishop said, you know, is a, a greater need to communicate with members of Congress about what your company does, why it's not uh, a threat uh, from the standpoint of uh, sensitive uh, industries, and why you're actually creating jobs that Americans uh, can take advantage of, and why that's a positive thing. I think that's a message. I think people are receptive to that kind of message. but in all candor, I think it is a very challenging environment. I, I, I could not agree more with what you just said, actually. I think communications is, is key and, and will be you know, key to this discussion and key to 
uh, is key for all Chinese companies operating in the United, in the United States. So, but, but thank you both for those sort of, uh, those introductory remarks. And um, I wanna take a step back if you don't mind. Um, there's a lot of uh, members uh, of the chamber. Um, some have been here for many years. Some are new uh, to the landscape in the US. And, and I thought if we could just spend a few minutes, um, not too long and not too uh, basic if you will, but a few minutes um, just discussing in, from your own experiences, um, the role of the U.S. Senate and the role of the House of Representatives in enacting these federal laws and policies, um, how the committees, you know, work in a sense, um, and then maybe if you can touch upon um, the congressmen's roles as well at the local level uh, and state, state and local level, if you will. Um, so why don't we start um, uh, with Mr. Bishop? We'll go. We'll sort of go round robin back and forth. Um, could you share your thoughts on, on that topic? There we go. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to talk about this. Um, it's um, the United States Congress can be a complicated place um, and mired down in a lot of different detail. Um, the process uh, for legislating at the federal level is different than that at the state level in most cases. Um, but when it comes to trade, uh, most of the trade issues and those uh, issues that we're talking about today um, on the subject of trade uh, emerge from the um, Ways and Means Committee in, in the uh, House. The Senate has their own committee, but the House does most of this, um, this policy making. So that discussion begins there. Um, you know, of course, through other issues that um, Congressman Wynn raised with regard to foreign relations and and um, other other matters that are pertinent to this discussion that emanate from other congressional committees, but uh, that's usually where it starts in the House, and uh, we have the opportunity to uh, take it up and discuss it. And then, obviously, anything that we do, we formally goes to the the House of Representatives for uh, discussion and for debate and for a final vote uh, if there's an actual bill that's produced. Um, this process is, is uh, important because it gives ample opportunity for open dialogue and for debate. Um, there are plenty of bills in Congress currently that address uh, in some way, shape or form, China-US relations. Um, so there is ample opportunity for the public to be involved by and through their members of Congress. Uh, this includes uh, what we do at the local level, what members of Congress do at the local level to speak with their constituents back at home. It also gives us the opportunity to uh, work with businesses who are impacted directly by legislation, public policy that's passed. Um, oftentimes uh, there is a a, a dramatic impact on certain economic um, um, uh, different different um, sectors of the economy. So it's important that we consider that as well. Um, when it comes to outside sources, and I know that there are other businesses on this discussion, uh, I wake up the next morning and find out that public policy has passed in the United States that has a direct impact on them. It could be a significant impact I would encourage you to be involved and to, uh, to make sure that you uh, are participating in this discussion with, with and through your, your member of Congress um, and or their staff um, so that the issues are raised and any concerns that you might have. Um, so it's, the, the process is open and inclusive. It doesn't seem like it at times, but I would encourage you to, to, um, to take it by the um, um, by the reins and really um, engage it. Uh, because uh, as a member, former member of Congress, I can tell you that we spent a lot of time reviewing public policy with interest holders, whether they be citizens or businesses. And um, that really is the subject of this discussion, how we can best uh, find our best way forward. And in order to do that, we need to have an open process that includes uh, the um, the uh, opportunity for folks like on, that are on this um, this uh, conference call to participate in, and I'm, I'm, I'm I would encourage you to be involved in that. 
I'm happy to talk more about it. That's there, the idea of having a, um, a Congress 101 discussion here is good. Uh, I just don't know how expansive that we can well, be. We don't have to I'm sure we could spend all day doing it. Right. Um, which, is, which I'm going to add a, a, a twist onto the question for, for Congressman Wynn. Um, we did see in the last year uh, or two several hundred bills that were introduced uh, in relation to China. Um, but yet only a handful of them, uh, and of course they all made the headlines, um, but only a handful of them actually made it out of committee. I mean, I'm sure, you know, once one of these bills get introduced and our members see it, uh, the head starts spinning, of course. Um, maybe you could shed some insight as to that process very briefly uh, and, and what is really going on there. Sure, and it's an excellent question. Uh, in fact, that's the norm, that there are going to be a lot of um, bills introduced, few will, few will ultimately pass, depending upon the intensity of the issue at the moment, that, that corresponds with the number of, um, of bills you see. So China's in the headlines for a variety of reasons. Okay, now you have a lot of China bills. The members of Congress will want to opine on, on the issue and present their perspective. Most of those bills overwhelmingly will not see the light of day, but they're good for the congressman's constituents to know that they're in, in, engaged. Uh, the serious work in the Ways and Means Committee uh, and other committees, Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, will result in very few bills actually uh, passing. They will be well thought out, they will be balanced, uh, and there will be lots of opportunities for input. Uh, the two bills I mentioned, the Endless Frontiers Act and the Strategic Competition Act, both in, in the Senate, are serious bills. Now, there may be 30, 50 additional bills, but that's the bill that you would want to focus on. Also, if there's a trade agreement, you'll have members weighing in, as Mike was just talking about, uh, with the administration. Basically, form the trade policies driven by the administration with input from members of Congress based on their districts and how it impacts. I mentioned the example of soybeans. So if you're in an agricultural district, you've got a great interest in trade and phase one agreements, uh, and you would provide that kind of input. Uh, but yes, uh, there are bills more designed for the headlines than they are for actual uh, passage. And so then at, at what point, since you never know what goes on behind closed doors, but at what point do you then engage your local congressman? Uh, once the bill is, is introduced into committee or is passed, I mean, how, how does that process typically play out, if you will? Well, let me follow up a little bit on that, because I think that is a, an important element of this conversation. It is never too early to address your local congressman. We have a saying, you can't make a friend when you need one, which to say the best time to build the relationship is before you have an issue, before there's a piece of legislation introduced. If your local congressman knows that you create 250, 500, local good paying jobs, if he knows that you're paying taxes, if he knows that you're participating uh, in uh, social corporate social responsibility activities within the local community, that's going to play a big role in how the congressman perceives your company and the degree of advocacy uh, that the congressman will engage in on your behalf. I think when you have a problem, you go to someone you know and explain the problem and also, it's always good to have a proposed solution in hand as to how it can, as of how the problem can be addressed. Congressman Bishop, you agree? I assume. I, I think that was a great <laughs> explanation. I, I couldn't, I couldn't say it better than that. I, I would just say, just anecdotally, I, I was, uh, I am from the Detroit area, and um, this past four years has been <laughs> difficult for auto. Manufacturers, it's been difficult for tier one suppliers here in the Michigan area when it comes to trade and tariffs and uh, uh, a lot of the sanctions that have been applied. It's directly impacted the global economy, but had a, a, a really uh, strong impact here in the state of Michigan. So I have been engaged, I was engaged in my last term in Congress with my community and my business leaders on the subject of trade directly. And they were very engaged in the process. And they did so early on. Um, but as Congressman Wynn suggested, 
they may have gotten involved too late because by the time they were able to really get uh, to express how this impacts them directly, it was too late. Uh, the tariffs have already been, the, the administration had already applied the tariffs and uh, we were in the process of the, the exemption process. After that, that was the only remedy that was available. And the, that remedy has not been applied in a very judicious way. Uh, it's, it's rarely used. Um, so while I was in Congress, I was working more on unwinding public policy based on those issues that were raised by my business leaders than actually being able to um, proactively stop it from happening in the first place. And so I, I would agree with Congressman Wynn that it's very important that if you have a concern about something that's coming your way or you hear it coming your way, that you let your member of Congress know so that uh, that, that can be inserted into the discussion as a consideration. So, so trade policy clearly is, 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 a, is a key focus and topic for, for the today, for the, for the members of the chamber. Um, from your time in Congress, um, how has that trade debate sort of evolved now? I mean, it's, it's now become a, I wanna say the, the China issue has actually defied the laws of gravity, has become a bipartisan issue uh in congress when it comes to china um but um a how do you feel it, it's evolved given the benefits that really the united states has has gained uh from advancing trade and investment with china um and then what do you think will be the priorities you know we, we saw what happened in alaska but what do you think are going to be the priorities for the biden administration in terms of its trade policies um congressman bishop why don't you start again I would, I would just use the, um, the process that we saw with uh, NAFTA in the U.S. Um, where we had to, we had to re-engage our partners uh, in the NAFTA agreement, uh, Canada and Mexico. That's, those two are our two biggest trading partners. So that, uh, not the original agreement. You mean the renegotiation under the Trump administration? The NAFTA, the, the new, well, right, the NAFTA agreement is what we renegotiated and we now have the US MCA. MCA. Sorry. And I raised that as an example only because uh, Mexico and Canada are two biggest trading partners for the United States and, and it's a priority for the United States to make sure that we have an efficient, uh, fair agreement with our two um, trading partners. And I think we have to approach that concept with our relationship with every country and in particular with China. Uh, there is really no reason why the two countries, well, there's lots of reasons <laughs> why we don't, <laughs> but uh, there's ample reason why we should be more actively involved in talking about those things that we can agree upon. Because if our relationship, the U.S. relationship with uh, Mexico and uh, Canada is any example, there is there's the sky's the limit as to what we can do with our two countries uh, to move forward with a with a with a trade agreement that would be mutually beneficial for both of us. So um, I think the U.S. has shown that it can negotiate and close trade deals. Um, I I hope that that's an example of what we can do with with China um, and work out our differences and get past our differences. They are significant to downplay it. Uh, it might be the, an understatement, it's the understatement of the, of the century that we, we have issues between the two countries. But um, if we ever hope to be able to have this discussion about uh, entering into a, a functional uh, trade agreement, we need to put those aside. And we saw a little bit of that in phase one back in 2020. Uh, that appeared to be a step in the right direction, and it's had some pretty good impact so far. And I hope that uh, there's a way to, to revisit that and see if we can expand upon that. Congressman Wynn, um, have you had any discussions with uh, your fellow congressman or current congressman or the administration on trade? I have fellow con more fellow congressmen, not so much the administration, <laughs> but what I've observed is a change, a rather significant change in terms of uh, both parties. Uh, I think the, the Republican Party used to be very much 
more pro pro trade. Um, Democrats less so, but still significantly the Obama administration, for example, and the Clinton administration, both pro trade. Post NAFTA, America, I think, is much less on both in both parties, much less pro trade, much more I don't say nationalistic in terms of its perspective, and so as a result, you then saw the emergence of Trump, Trumpism, and that whole nationalistic uh, perspective uh, to a significant st extent still still remains, um, and it's a very very different climate on on both sides of the aisle. Now, in terms of policy, you take USMCA. What's changed? Well, two things significantly. One, worker rights have been significantly elevated. That was the sticking point. That was the basis for the resolution. Uh, as Democrats forget, drilled down and said, look, we're going to have to make some changes that are clearly much more pro-worker. Uh, that was accomplished, and USMCA came in, into being. That level of, of concern about worker rights was not the case 10, 20 years ago. Similarly, climate. Uh, USMCA was also stuck and, and almost failed to some extent because of climate concerns. Climate concerns will be elevated to a much greater degree in uh, future uh, trade agreements. I do think, and, and, and Mike mentioned, uh, mentioned phase one, there is no question that there is an appetite for um, trade in non-sensitive areas. And I think we will continue to see efforts as even the Trump administration made efforts to negotiate agricultural purchases uh, and the like. And so I, I think there's a good basis for saying uh, in non-sensitive areas, there's a base for cooperation, particularly as emotions cool down. We're at a, a rather heightened point now, but I think uh, that emotions will cool down. I think we will see trade cooperation uh, emerge. But those two elements, worker rights and, and climate considerations, will definitely be uh, much more prominent. So then that, that might move into another topic, which is a big uh, up and coming uh, bill for this administration is the infrastructure plan. Uh, um, I think the Republicans are somewhere around uh, 600 billion. I think the, the Biden administration is a couple trillion. Um, how, how do you see the infrastructure plan um, uh, going through Congress? And do you think um, that all companies, including Chinese companies, which I'm sure as you know, there are several Chinese infrastructure companies, uh, construction companies that, that operate here in the U.S. Um, many Chinese companies supply construction in the U.S. and uh, banks, uh, similar to Bank of China and other Chinese banks that operate here in the U.S., um, finance these types of projects all over the world. Um, and China certainly has an enormous amount of experience. We've seen the growth of infrastructure in China with high-speed rail, uh, high-speed rail, um, uh, and other transportation uh, and port projects, if you will. Um, wh where do you see, how do you see the infrastructure bill panning out and, and for Chinese companies operating in the U.S.? Congressman Bishop. Okay. I'm sorry. No, I'm I started sorry. with Congressman Bishop last time. Let me start okay, with Congressman right. Wayne. Sorry about that. Go okay. ahead. Um, I think there are a lot of opportunities. I talked about the challenges and obstacles, but there are actually a lot of opportunities with respect to the infrastructure uh, bill. Uh, I think it's going to pass. Uh, I think there is more uh, to separate out the bill to focus on traditional infrastructure plus broadband, that's roads, bridges, uh, transit. Uh, and those types of things, and, and broadband, and other more uh, broad definitions of, of, uh, of infrastructure, uh, caregiving and health infrastructure, probably in a second bill. So the first core bill is where I think there are a great number of opportunities. Uh, if you're involved in construction, construction finance, uh, project management, any of those aspects of it, uh, concrete production, uh, any of the raw materials inputs, uh, I think there's certainly opportunities there uh, that would be welcomed. And again, and to go back to an earlier question, 
a lot of those decisions are going to be made at the state and local level, which is to say the federal government is going to pass ultimately a, a bill, a bipartisan uh, infrastructure bill. And, but that money is going to be spent at the state and local level on specific highways and specific towns and the like. And so relationships at the state level, familiarity with state procurements will be an important element uh, for success. But I think it presents a great number of opportunities. Congressman Bishop? I, um, I agree with that. I think there are substantial opportunities and it's, um, I do believe that uh, there will be a bill that passes and I think it will have bipartisan support. My only concern with the current discussion is how greedy members of Congress get about what's gonna be in this bill. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, if they can limit it to the necessary infrastructure that's really specific to infrastructure, I think, I think it passes. My, my biggest concern lingering as always, but especially right now, is that we, the Congress just spent $6 trillion in the past year on stimulus. That's a lot of money. And that was all added to debt. So I, uh, I am concerned that uh, there's not a lot left to go around. And I, I don't know where it's going to come from. Um, but there are members who are very concerned about it and who, uh, who, who are reticent to spend more. Um, so I think that that's a concern. That's the primary concern from the Republican side in particular uh, is the, uh, the cost of the bill. We haven't seen a vehicle yet, so we don't know exactly what the bill will look like. Um, but I do think it will come in two parts as well. And I think that um, the first one will be uh, the, the deciding factor as to what Republicans do and, and uh, if, if they want to get involved in that kind of spending. Um, my, my guess is, though, it'll be such a significant impact, important impact for the country that you'll see bipartisan support. Okay, so I want, before I go on to the next question, I want to remind uh, the audience that if there are questions, uh, please place, please put them in the uh, Q&A box. Um, I'm actually seeing, I'm, I'm actually going to read before I, I do have more questions in my lineup, but I do want to get uh, some questions from the audience. So. Um, let me see the first one here. When local congressmen pass bills or are working on bills, um, how much do they consider the local voices? Um, where do they look for the community's voice and where does the community's voice, is it, is it visible? Um, is there a website? Is it physical? Um, it, it, I, I want to say that actually kind of relates to a question I had uh, as a follow-up question, which there's certainly a lot of uh, rules uh, regarding lobbying, uh, there's LDA rules, there's FARA rules. Um, maybe you can touch upon briefly, you know, how, how do the congressmen or how can the companies and the communities uh, properly and, and better engage um, with folks like yourself, with congressmen like yourselves, either on, 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 on the House of Representatives side or on the Senate side? Um, congressman Bishop, why don't you start, please? Well, there, there are ample ways in which uh, interested parties can contact the members of Congress, and I do encourage it. Um, there are obviously rules with regard to how that communication takes place when it comes to foreign governments. And uh, special consideration needs to be taken to ensure that you're compliant with those rules and regulations. Um, that said, though, uh, it, it's, you can speak through uh, your, if, if it's a foreign country, they can speak through their local, um, um, you know, uh, elect, um, support in the, in the, in the United States, uh, whether that be their, their lobbying firm that's, has a, a connection with the Congress or, or, um, through a, an embassy, we've had discussions through an embassy. There are a lot of different ways in which you can get your concerns, your communications to members of Congress um, in a legal way. And it's important to do that. At the state level, every state's different. And um, if, if money has been um, um, appropriated to states for purposes of, of 
of spending on infrastructure, for example. The states then have jurisdiction over how that money is spent, and they have their own rules with regard to how uh, they, they communicate with interested parties. So it's a complicated process. My, my, my um, advice would be to speak with, um, if you're in a foreign country and wishing to interact with members of Congress, that you speak with your local, um, if you have local counsel or a lobbying firm, uh, on how to best do that. Congressman Wynn? Yeah, I uh, think- How have you uh, best engaged with, with your community? Again, foreign companies or, or domestic, either one. How, what, what has been the most effective way, if you will, in, in your experience? I will tell you the absolute most effective way to do this. Okay. And that is to invite a local congressman to your facility. If you have a plant, a construction, site, a laboratory, whatever the case may be, invite him out for a tour. He comes and he's interested in coming because his constituents work there, a point that you are reinforcing by having him there and seeing them work there. Uh, that is, I think, an invaluable tool. It's relatively easy because members of Congress periodically, of course, go back to their home districts. An invitation to come out and meet, you meet the, the facility management, you meet corporate management, and you meet the line workers who are the constituents of the congressman. So I think that is, is an important tool. Um, again, I go back to relationship building uh, with state uh, representatives, for example, uh, that you should get to know the local representatives. There's a local state senator, there's a local state representative or a delegate from your area that you should know because those people interact with the congressman. Uh, so if the state representative says to the congressman, this is a really good business uh, and we need to be aware of that when this trade bill comes down the line, then that of course is very helpful. I actually represent uh, a Chinese company and I do work in terms of uh, advice for, in terms of the federal level, but I think the state level is as important if not more important for most companies uh, that are not necessarily global companies uh, but want to know, okay, where's the money, where are the contracts? Getting to know the state representatives uh, who can then introduce them to the procurement process in terms of how it works is very important. Uh, and I think that's probably the most efficient way to, to do it. To do. And, and one other thing is obviously working in alliance with similar businesses. So if you're in construction, uh, it behooves you to be involved not only as your own advocate, but also as part of a larger association that has a similar view as yours. So it's not just your company, but it's your company in alliance with others making the same basic point. Uh, you know, can I, may I say something else there as sure, well? Sure, of course. Um, I think it's important too. I, I like the idea of inviting a member to uh, visit the facility. I think that's good. But I also think it's important to note that uh, members of Congress and local elected officials at the same time um, can be put in a really bad spot if, if, if they're asked to participate in the procurement process. Um, if a particular company wants to, uh, to have a bid on a, on a contract um, uh, or wants to in some way engage in, um, in for example, the infrastructure uh, bill and the monies that have been allotted for that, you, you have to be careful about talking to elected officials because they don't really, you, you need to engage with the particular department and the administration. Um, and, and that's not something that elected officials can do to a certain extent. You, you really have got to be separate from them to do that. So you have to know the process in each case, whether it's at the federal or state level, and just be careful not to put your elected member in a bad position. Uh, I think that, I agree. I, Can I, I think just that, follow up on that for a little bit? Sure, sure, of course. Because Mike raised it a very, very important a point. I intervene in a procurement. All the member can do is make sure you know where to go to get information about that procurement. He's not going to say, oh, you should give it to Company X because I visited their plant. Not at all. But they can say, uh, this is a procurement officer. If you have any questions, or this is who you need to talk to if you have questions. But absolutely, you cannot put a, a congressman in a compromising position. 
And if you do so, approach him with the idea that he can, quote, deliver a contract, I think that would be a big mistake. I, I think that ties into a point, I think that, that Congressman Wynn, I think you made earlier on in this conversation, is that it's never too early to engage with your congressman. So in other words, or woman, um, which is, you know, don't wait until you need a friend, but uh, it may be when you're just setting up your facility or, or a year anniversary or um, a Chinese New Year's party, whatever it is, um, to invite your local congressman just to see, show them what you're doing. And then this way they know more about you um, when you don't necessarily need them. And then um, they have a, a certain, a good impression as far as what, what the company or Chinese company has been doing um, both locally and, and, uh, and internationally. Um, another, another question that, that came up in the, in the chat room, which is another one that's on a lot of people's mind, um, is throughout the past year, you know, we've seen in our communities across the United States and elsewhere, um, enormous challenges in terms of um, the anti-Asian hate and, and violence. Uh, and so uh, the question here is what, A, where do you feel, where's Congress's role in dealing with this at the local level uh, in, in terms of the AAPI discrimination and, and how should members of the community reach out? Um, you know, we have a lot of Chinese members uh, in, in, our, in our chamber. Um, how should they reach out on, these, on this topic? Um, Congressman Wynn, why don't you start? Well, I think it is an absolutely critical issue I'm very pleased to see that there's been legislation introduced uh, against uh, anti-Asian hate. I, at the risk of sounding partisan, I was very pleased to see uh, some members of the Republican Party call out some of their, their uh, colleagues at the state level for some uh, inappropriate remarks they made. And I think those were great acts of courage on their part and very appropriate. Uh, I think the idea, again, of knowing your congressman before you need him so that when something like this arises, the congressman has a frame of reference having worked with you and getting, gotten to know you as a, a member of the community and seen your work to take a strong stand. Similarly, you're in a position to pick up the phone and call the congressman and say, congressman, I'd really appreciate it if you'd issue a public statement against hate, or we really appreciate it if you'd come down to this rally we're having against hate. So again, Building the relationship enables you to engage the congressman uh, at, at an appropriate time. Congressman Bishop? I, I yeah, would agree. And this is a very nonpartisan issue. I think both sides, Republicans and Democrats, believe that they should do whatever they can to, to ensure that uh, there is no such hate in our country. Um, you know, we, we have to uh, we have to acknowledge the fact that we're having some serious problems in our country right now. And uh, a lot of that has to do with the fact that uh, the politics and the political rhetoric has taken over um, and it's divided this country. And so I, uh, I would say to you, when we see the violence against any particular nation uh, or, or race, religion, it's very important for all of us to lock arms and to, to ensure that we do everything we can to, to speak out against it and to support legislation uh, if that's what it takes to address the issue. And I do know those issues, those bills have been introduced both at the, uh, the federal and the state level and all across the country. So this is an issue and I, I just wanna ensure everybody on this, this um, um, conference uh, Zoom call that it is a priority for federal and state government to do whatever they can to support local law enforcement and to support um, uh, all, all, all the different uh, interest groups that are out there that are facing these issues. And um, I, I would say that uh, that is a, a, a very, very um, across the board kind of priority for, for uh, this country as a whole. Um, and remember, members of Congress are, are elected by their constituents, and they have to reflect the views of their, their constituents. And I would say that an absolutely, um, you know, one-sided discussion about what should be done. And the public very much supports Congress acting strongly, all state governments acting strongly to support and uh, to deter, deter hate crimes. 
I, I, I think I, I, I could not agree with you more. Um, certainly the chamber uh, has done its best and put out uh, a statement uh, against uh, AAPI violence and hatred. Um, but I think there's, there's always more that we can all do, certainly from a, from a personal level um, to a company level and to a, to a, a congressional level. Um, back sort of to the US-China engagement and, and relationship at, at the congressional level, of course. Um, is it, and I'm, this is sort of a tough question to ask, but you know, given where we are in the political cycle and, and we're coming out of uh, a four year Trump administration uh, and, and still hopefully maybe last part of a trade war, but uh, still uh, engulfed in a trade war with China um, and the number of bills that we're seeing um, uh, against China or, or activities with China. Is, is there, do you see, will there, is it political taboo in a sense to even propose a, uh, a bipartisan uh, bill in support of some of the common areas um, that we can cooperate on? Areas like climate change, areas like healthcare, uh, areas like global security. Do you, do you think there, there's that motivation there uh, or is that gonna be driven solely by uh, the administration and the White House or you know, can, it be, can it be influenced at the congressional level or, or is that just taboo at this point? And what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Congressman Bishop, why don't we start with you? I, I think there's a lot that can be done. Um, I think that there's a lot being discussed as we, uh, as we uh, conduct this uh, conference today in Congress to, to find opportunities to work together on, on issues. Uh, Congressman Wynn delivered a excellent presentation, his opening statement about the issues that, you know, that concern our nation um, and the members of Congress. He, he really hit the nail on the head on things that are impacting uh, the way members of Congress think. And it's very political right now. So it's important for members to maybe do a little grandstanding for their constituents to show that they're, they're doing whatever they can to address these issues. I don't mean to minimize the motives of members of Congress, but that, you know, that's really what happens. You have um, bills introduced to address those, those hot button issues. They probably won't go anywhere but uh, they're out there and they impact uh, the overall discussion and attitude of Congress towards China. In my heart of hearts, I would love to see uh, the United States and China come together on one big issue to try and pull the attention away from uh, this, all these other uh, competing messages. And I would suggest that uh, the best issue out there right now is this, this um, climate issue. Um, the two, these two uh, uh, governments have the ability to lead a massive uh, campaign to rid the world of fossil fuel, fuel dependence. And th this would be an, a, just an incredible way for us to work together on a, on a solution or a series of solutions to address that issue. And I guess I'm, I'm living in a fantasy world to think that uh, that can, that can happen right now, but I do think it's an idea that could really make a difference and uh, would pave the way for a much more positive discussion about issues facing our two countries. Congressman Wynn? I completely uh, agree with Congressman Bishop that climate is one of the areas where you have bipartisan hopefulness, which is to say people acknowledge we've got differences with China, but we need China to deal with the climate issue. And a lot of members, and I think the administration would like to work toward that and will work to, toward that uh, because it's got to be a global effort. Uh, I just think right now, tensions are high. Tensions will cool, the headlines will, will, will slow and people will then roll up their sleeves. Okay, where, what are areas of agreement like climate? And I think we'll get some things done. I remain optimistic. So um, I'm going to pose one more question. Um, actually, there's one more question. I, I, it's a short question, very brief one. Uh, and then I'll go to my final question. Um, I, that a lot of these bills that get introduced and then end up going nowhere um, or end up not passing out of committee. Uh, there is a question from the audience. 
what happens to them? Do they, are they still, uh, do they just sort of die upon arrival? Uh, or is it something that they just hold off to the side, wait for the next round of China debate, if you will? Well, a, a couple of things will happen with that bill. First of all, uh, at a hearing, there will be noise made. In other words, comments made, statements made that coordinate uh, the importance of that bill with maybe another another vehicle. Okay, let's. This is why you ought to add my bill on. Okay, it's not going to be added on. It's too extreme. Uh, but second, the member says, okay, to the folks back home and press statements. This is where I stood against 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 China. And third, they tried it out again the following session uh, because again there's a significant amount of legislation that is largely for the advancement of the individual congressman as opposed to movement by the entire Congress. Those decisions are largely made, those that move, are made by the committee chairmanship and the congressional leadership. And so the rest of the bills, they have symbolic value, but they don't have significant political impact. The more extreme, the less likely they'll see the light of day. So I'm, I'm going to pose a final question here, um, and then I'll save a minute or so for any final comments from the, from the congressman, and then I'll close the, the webinar. Um, but American companies, and we, I want to close on this on, uh, in terms for American companies, they continue to invest in China, seeking market share. Farmers are you know, seeking more exports uh, to China. Um, yet we're seeing still these increasing costs for businesses and consumers from the trade war, um, Chinese foreign direct investment uh, at its peak in 2016 um, was a great bump for foreign direct investment in the United States. It, it supports jobs, it supports uh, growth, and a lot of the members of, of the Chamber of Commerce, I think in total, I think is, is somewhere around 120, 130 billion dollars has been invested over the years uh, alone from our member companies. Um, so given American companies' interest in China, uh, given the Chinese companies um, that do want to come here and support uh, local investment and trade, um, what is maybe in a sense your advice to Congress or how do you speak to Congress on how uh, to find a better approach to ba better balance the national security interests um, that, have been, that have been laid out um, by various members of the administration, past and present, and really the proven benefits um, to American companies, American consumers, uh, local communities um, from this uh, import and export paradigm. Um, Congressman Bishop, why don't we start with you? Well, we, we still have a 400 or so billion dollar, um, uh, you know, the the, um, the deficit uh, between the two countries is still $400 billion trade deficit, um, somewhere around there. I think that's a real problem, and it's what the Trump administration was getting at with uh, its policies towards um, China. Uh, I, I don't know that there's going to be a big change from uh, the, the previous administration to the current administration uh, quickly. It didn't appear, I thought it would, but uh, it does not appear as though that's going to happen very quickly. So you know, we still live under the same concerns. I do think that if we're going to get past this, we need to look at some of the, 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 the real progress that we've made in, for example, phase one, but raising that as another issue. Uh, it's the bright spot in the past four years in the relationship. And, uh, and we've seen some some progress there. And I'm, I'm from Michigan. Our second biggest um, economy here is our agribusiness economy after cars and automo automotive. Uh, we, our farmers are very grateful uh, that we, we have new markets in China for goods and uh, farm goods. So we like to see that continue. Um, so I think if we can show the world economy and, um, you know, our, 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 respective economies, how important it is to develop a good business relationship um, and, and, and really um, illustrate that, that benefit. The more we do that, the more agreements. 
Um, until then, we're kind of mired down in a lot of different issues that are very political. And um, we have grandstanding going on between the two sides at uh, public meetings uh, that are intended to really for their own base, to impress their own base. Um, that's not helping anybody. And uh, we just have to put put our money where our mouth is and and um, and get these trade deals off the ground and show where they're beneficial. Congressman Wynn, final words from you. Yeah, I agree with uh, Congressman Bishop. I think that we have to separate out and resolve these issues surrounding sensitive industries. Uh, a large part of that will be U.S. investment in U.S. companies to make them more competitive to address uh, supply line sensitivities uh, and, and those kinds of uh, questions. The more we address those, the more the temperature uh, comes down. And then we can talk about the areas where we have agreement. We desperately want uh, foreign direct investment. We desperately want to export agricultural goods. We just want to make sure there's a level playing field. So we're addressing that right now with some of the legislation coming out of the Senate. But ultimately, I think both parties would like to see robust trade uh, on, a, on a fair basis. And uh, certainly, the infrastructure bill provides some different kinds of opportunities, not necessarily trade opportunities, but investment opportunities. But the trade uh, opportunities, even the Trump administration was eager uh, to do phase one. I think once the Biden administration addresses the legitimate security concerns, they would be very welcoming of a cooperative trade arrangement. I think everybody everybody on the call here is certainly looking forward to that. Uh, is there, uh, before I conclude, are there any final comments uh, either of you would like to make? I would, just, I would just say thank you very much for including me and, and uh, it's an honor to, to be here with uh, the chairman and with uh, Congressman Wynn and you, Peter, and all of the folks that have uh, have participated in this discussion. Uh, I hope that we have the opportunity to meet in person and, and uh, continue on the discussion. I, think I would echo that. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I've enjoyed the conversation. And I think we need more of these. I look forward to participating and, and supporting these kinds of conversations because fundamentally to resolve these issues, you have to start with some degree of dialogue and conversation. I think it's a great step again. Thank you very much for allowing me to participate. Thank you. I think I think that is the message at the end of the day that it's it is about dialogue, it's about understanding, and it's about building building trust. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, conclude by saying that you know it's CGCC is the largest and most influential and independent nonprofit organization representing Chinese companies in the U.S. Um, we're committed to facilitating that type of cooperation, that type of trust building. Um, and representing the interests of Chinese and American members um, as they seek to expand their operations and investments uh, both here in the U.S. and across borders. Um, it, it's what, what CGC prides itself on uh, in building programs like this. Uh, and we look forward to doing more programs uh, on this topic and on other topics. 